Alex, how you doing, man? Good, how are you? I'm doing good. So, PRCW is working pretty good. Yeah, congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, I just uh, just won the Nationals with that thing. And that was the first time I've been shooting at a club matches for a few months. And I was like, all right, it's worth taking it to the Nationals. I actually brought two of them. I brought uh, two different ones. I shot one at mid-range. And it was just windy. It was windy as hell. And uh, I ended up second place. Uh, I came within one point of cleaning the whole thing at uh, mid-range. And then when we went to the long range, I pulled out the other PRCW and ended up winning. So, yeah, I'm going to say they work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, Jay's been running one for, I don't know, probably close to three years now, I think. He kind of kept it quiet there. But, he, yeah, I mean, the guys, everybody seems to be doing well with them. And, and they should because it's not really – it's not really something uh, all that different than what we've been doing with the 284. It's similar size, and that was kind of the point. Uh, just a little better design is all. So, how does the uh, how does the PRCW come about? Uh, well, I you know I don't know how long ago it was, but been playing with throats lead angles you know anything you can to find an advantage um we started it you know in, in long range bench press mostly and you know there's pros and cons to the different angles and and so jay um christopherson me and him talk on and off you know tuning stuff usually and i i know he's a pretty good tuner so i said hey do you want to try this cartridge what what you know Basically, the 280, what you call the 284 wheeler, which is pretty much a straight mm -hmm. 284, but a little different lead. Um, and so he tried that, and um, you know, I think he he thinks it was an improvement over what we had been doing. So it was kind of him. He said, "Hey, would you work? Would you help? Would you work with me on on coming up with something to beat the 284?" And so I kind of looked at the case designs that were out there. SOM has been around, it, it hasn't been dominant, so we know that's the wrong direction to grow to go. Um, the 284 is about the right size, it, it, you know, capacity-wise. Um, and so I just tried to find a case that was similar in capacity, a shorter powder column, um, and that's why I didn't improve it. I didn't want to make it bigger. And, you know, at the time, we didn't have Lapua brass still. It was ADG, um, still pretty new cartridge, but um, I mean, it, it wasn't that difficult because there's not that many cartridges, you know, in that capacity. So it just one of the things I think I learned from uh, cartridge design in thousand yard Ventrest, you know, we ran the Dasher for a long time. Uh, we'd see a flyer, we'd see it go out of tune, we'd see it do something a little stupid that it shouldn't have. And so, you know, I kind of was thinking maybe it was borderline too big. And then, you know, the BRA comes along and I think, I think it's proved that, you know, it probably was borderline too big. So really the, the smallest case you can get away with to reach that node that you're trying to shoot, any bigger than that, I think is, is the wrong way to go. Is uh, that brings up an interesting topic? Is nodes you, you mentioned trying to reach that node? Is there such a thing as speed nodes? People talk about that all the time. You know, it's like, oh, we, I want to be able to reach the SOM node, or I want to, I want to reach the twenty eight eighty node, or I want to reach the twenty twenty nine hundred node. Is there a speed node, or is this just comes down to powder, barrel length, case capacity combinations that yeah, they just shoot I mean, wherever they're going to shoot. There is and there isn't. Um, you know, typically, you know, you can move that velocity node if you change powders. Even a lot of powder can move it. You know, a good example, like in the BRA, um, some lots of powder want to shoot that 2880, 2890. Others want to run a little over 3000. 
it's kind of the same it's that what we'd consider the high node but just one lot of powder can can move that and so yeah you'll see since most of the stuff in competition we're all doing something similar so if a guy's running 4350 in a psalm and and there's 50 guys doing that and they're all shooting the same bullet and very similar reamers they'll 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 probably come to the conclusion that there's a, a velocity node there but that's all that all gets moved around if you change something so so there is and there isn't i would say there isn't i'm not going to say uh, a particular bullet is going to shoot 2920 you know it, it could depending on the combination of components but it might not depending on you know if you change something so so no there isn't i don't think there's solid nodes like that but um you know, using similar components, we seem to end up in close places. Hey, have you noticed there's almost no commercials on this episode? That's because we're being sponsored by Creedmoor Sports. Creedmoor Sports has been around since 1979. Go check out their website. I'm sure you're going to find something there that you like. And at checkout, if you type in Cortina Ship, you're going to get free shipping on any order of $99 or more. Then come back. And I get it. I understand why they do it, but they go... Well, you know, the, the 284 likes to shoot at 2770 and, uh, you know, 284 Shahane likes to shoot at whatever. And the Psalm likes to shoot at X speed. Well, no, I think it just has to do with case capacity. Uh, and what ends up happening is oftentimes the newer shooters, they're, they're like, well, I hear they shoot good at this speed and this is where I'm going to load it at. And I think they're leaving a lot on the table when they do that because I've... I found, like I was told the PRC, you know, W, oh, you know, it shoots good at 2920. Just load it at 2920 and go. Well, I tested mine, and guess what? 2920 shot good, but 2950 to 60 shot better. And I test, you know, I test a lot. I have a thousand yard range, and I, you know, I would shoot, you know, I, I usually, when I test, I cover, you know, I don't just test one load, I cover. Uh, on each side of that same load multiple times uh, and uh, you know I kind of got that from uh, from Todd Hendricks he does that and I started doing it and it just makes sense but the point is the 2950 to 60 always beat out the 2920 2920 wasn't bad but it just wasn't as good and I just think people leave a lot on the table when when they just decide this is where I'm going to shoot it yeah, you definitely can't do that. I mean, a good example is the last rifle I built myself. Um, early on, um, ended up it was ended up tracing it down to the action body, which is kind of the first time I've ever seen this problem. But I, I was struggling with a little bit of pressure, and so I ended up running four different lots of powder in that rifle. They're all forty eight ninety five, just four different lots, and they would all tune up at different places, and so. Um, some of them are slower, some of them are faster, but yeah, you definitely, and you're right. You got to cover both sides of that node. You got to find your window. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's a, hopefully people don't, don't do that. <laughs> well, the, uh, the other thing that I, that I hear in, in, uh, you know, they, they go, well, well. You know the psalm. This the the the. You know, we've got to shoot the psalm. I guess what I'm asking is, uh, there's a lot of people improving this this PRCW. There there seems to be this. Uh, uh, seems like everybody wants to always improve something. <laughs> they just don't think it's good enough as is, and uh, it's it's already bigger than the Shahane. You know, I shot the Shahane for many many years, and this one's slightly larger, and I mean, brass life is great. I don't know. What what do you get when you improve something, in your opinion? Like, you know, especially well, the PRCW or the 6.5 PRC. Well, I mean, you can you can hide pressure. Um, you know, that's kind of the deal with the Ackleys or the Shermans, in, in my opinion, is, you know, if you straighten out that case, you put a 40-degree shoulder on it, it seems to hide pressure. I mean, you can, you can it, uh, it, it reduces bolt thrust. So, 
if if you need that, I guess if you're trying to get a little more out of the case, then then you can do that. Uh, as far as accuracy, I don't believe there's anything there. I mean, we got you know the PPC, the the, the WSM, and the dashers, and I mean they're all different shoulder angles, and they're all at the top of their their own game. Um, so I don't think there's an accuracy advantage in any of that stuff. Um, and a lot of times when you improve something, you know, this is one thing I did that was probably the most disappointing cartridge I ever did, uh, was I improved the seven song and this wasn't meant for competition. It was meant for hunting rifles and, and guys that like to just, just play around with stuff. It didn't gain me nothing. I just put more powder in and got right back to where I started. And so if you don't make enough of an improvement to where you can, you know, add enough powder or, or go to a slower powder, then you don't really see uh, the benefit. You know, and I guess you could also say you don't have to trim the brass as much on, but everybody's got the, the Gerard or whatever in all these trimmers that make it no big deal. So um, I, I did think about swinging the shoulder down on this thing you know, making it 40, but swinging it down, making the neck longer. But I really don't like doing that because you get that thicker brass up in the neck and, and, and it's just, you're messing with the brass. And I think the less we mess with that virgin case, um, the better. It just seems to make better brass. Yeah, you're already going to get some of the thicker brass in the neck simply by necking it up. So swinging that shoulder down it's just going to make it drastically worse it would be nasty yeah so so i just left it alone i figured that was the the way to go because you know if, if we if you improved it if you did swing it up and put a 40 on there and straighten it out i'm not so sure it would get to the next node anyways you know um so and i don't think you want to i don't think you would want to run it faster than you are i don't think it would ag as well I mean, we've tried that. The guys have tried six by 47s and bench rest. You know, it's kind of, it, it's the wrong way to go in my opinion. So you push them too hard and it just, it's fine for hunting rifles and different things like that. But if we're talking about agging and competition, you know, it's uh, more is not better. So define agging. There's a lot of people watching that they probably don't understand the term agging. Um, I mean, I, I, you know, it's cons how consistent it can be, but explain it in your own terms, please. Well, I guess it's, it's just another word for average. Um, you know, you're going to look at, look at all your groups or all your scores that you've shot, you know, either across the whole season, you know, depending on what you're shooting. Um, you know, in bench rest, there's, there's 10 and 20 target aggregates. That's, that's all your targets that you shot the whole year. You don't get to pick and choose. Um, and, and same in your game, you know, you're going to look at the grand ag. That's your, all your scores combined, you know, you don't get to throw out the bad target. And so, um, a gun that will shoot consistently without flyers, without going out of tune and stuff like that. You know, it's it's a lot handier to have something like that than something that'll shoot that screamer tiny little group, but then it won't repeat it or it's, it'll spit flyers occasionally, things like that. And and I think people blame themselves and conditions uh, a lot more than they should when the gun is actually doing that. It's either either in the tune or the mechanics of the rifle. Um, it's really good guns don't don't really fight you like that. So. But because it's a thousand, we just always assume it had to be a condition. Um, you know, and a lot of times when that gun's on fire, man, it's kind of hard to mess them up. The uh, the ever so called the range vertical, right? Well, this range gives you vertical, right? And uh, that's one thing that uh that I talked to John Myers about. Uh, you know, after he retired, he he was. Uh, he pretty much gave me all his tuner information, you know, probably not all of it. I'm sure he held some back, <laughs> but uh, that's the reason I redesigned my tuner. And I have that V2 tuner now because, you know, I took his input and uh, he, he showed me how to use them. And he says, most people don't know how to use tuners. And uh, because of that, they're going to seem inconsistent. 
because it's it's like it's like a barrel, right? Like a barrel is not going to stay in tune. It takes a very special barrel to stay in tune all the time, right? Uh, and uh, so, so so the point is, he told me that he loved Phoenix. He said that is the the, the range that he likes the most because of how uh inconsistent it is from the morning to the afternoon i mean in the morning you're wearing a jacket and and gloves and all kinds of stuff you know to shoot right. and by midday you already st stripped everything off and now it's sunny and it's the mirage is up and and it's very easy to simply say well this range gives you vertical mm -hmm. he said it's not the range you just gotta know how to yeah. keep the rifle in tune and uh you know i guess uh i'm gonna say he was right after after this week you know because well, uh, there's no doubt about it yeah i mean the know, guns my rifle stayed in tune the whole time and you know it it uh i don't think i dropped a single point to vertical the whole week yeah through with both rifles yeah that's um i i mean there's certainly a lot of ways different guys try to keep their guns in tune and and for us at long range we really don't have time to be loading in between targets so it's it's difficult I mean, I've seen guys, you know, push their bullets back in between targets, anything that you can do. You can warm or cool the ammunition, you know, if, the, if, if, if you're getting some vertical and you think you're hot, you know, I've put my ammo in, in the cooler before and, and saved, my, saved myself from a really nasty target. Um, there's different things you can try to do or, or use the tuner. Um, and there's, there's guys that do that, that as well. Um, but that is kind of... That's kind of the name of the game is 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 finding that tune and then staying on it. Um, and here, you know, at Deep Creek in the mountains here, we got a similar thing. You know, we can wake up and we can see a 40 degree change easily in a day. So, yeah, it's it's actually it's surprising that, that they can shoot as well as they do with all the all the variables that we have to deal with. Yeah, the, and and again, that goes part of the that, that goes back to kind of all the testing that I was doing, where I was testing an entire you know a window that was about a grain wide, and I thought, well, this thing, you know, kind of on the outer bounds, it's not as good, but it was still not terrible. So I I knew that even if it went pretty far out of tune, it would still be a competitive rifle, and it was. I mean, it just. Uh, it just shot consistent the whole time, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's, I think, I think too many people settle on a load before they should. Um, you know, the, these, these rifles, they will shoot so small at a thousand. Um, just, they'll shoot so small. So, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, if you start with a, a five inch tune, and it goes out, you know, that, that's kind of the way I look at it is if you say five inches, that's X-ring, that's good enough. Okay, well, as it goes out of tune, you're getting in trouble. I'd rather start with something that'll shoot twos or threes or even better. And as it goes out of tune and it adds an inch or two to the group, it's not going to kill me. And so, I mean, that's always kind of been my my thought on it is because um, these things can shoot a lot better, I think, than and people realize that's uh that's one uh thing that uh when i had brian litz on he said that his gun was 0.6 at 100 yards and that's he called that good enough and i don't disagree with him because he quit shooting in 2017 back then you know especially if you can read the wind pretty good you, right. you know, and, and you know in ftr you could be competitive but nowadays you know, the way the guns are, even TR is super competitive. I mean, those guys are shooting cleans. I don't think in 2017, anybody was shooting clean targets, right? So you didn't need a gun that would shoot a clean target. Now, if the wind is consistent, they're shooting clean. That means yeah. all shots, all 20 shots in, in one MOA. And if you start with 0.6 at 100, number one, you have your natural dispersion by the time you get a 0.6 at 100 is not six inches at a thousand it's it's you add all everything else you may already be in perfect conditions not be able to clean a target and in ftr i mean those guys it was so windy so windy this week 
And those guys were still shooting 198s, 199s at a thousand. That's amazing with a 308. It is incredibly amazing. I was pulling for James Crofts, and it was, I had on my rifle, my PRCW, 180 hybrids at 2950. I had four minutes on the gun, and I was still holding about anywhere from a minute to minute and a half on target. And James Crofts, <laughs> I go and I'm pulling for him, and I'm like, I, I wonder where this is going to end up, because I just assume he's going to end up. I had no idea. It's 308, right? He punches it right in the center. He, he was slightly high, but I mean, for windage, he was dead on. And I I failed to ask him how he managed to do that because he must have put seven or eight minutes on the gun. Right. It's incredible what these guys do. Yeah. But anyway, back to the back to the consistency and being able to ag. I mean, everything's better nowadays. Bullets are better. Barrels are better the information that's out there i mean everybody can can a new shooter can go on right now and they can just go on accurate shooter go on youtube go facebook whatever that information is going to be out there that they can put a really good rifle together hell they don't even have to do the work they can come to you and say alex i want to shoot f class and i want to shoot at a very high competitive level and you're like okay here's what you need and you can put them together everything they need it's, yeah it's I, gotten super simple yeah and i guess that's kind of the point is um at, at least for me you know just standing in front of the lathe all day i mean yeah that doesn't really work your mind at all and so the the point is to um you know to, always looking for something to, to improve and so you've got your shooters out there and they're going to matches and you want them to win and so that's that's where you start getting into the ignition uh, and reamer design and, and different specs and 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 just looking for anything and everything you can, and that's really what's interesting. And so you know, as that stuff happens, I think um, it raises it raises everybody up, and you know that's that's really what keeps my interest is I want to see smaller groups next year than we shot this year, and uh, and so that's. That's what keeps my interest is, you know, I really like playing with ignition. That's super interesting. There's a lot there. That's that's way more important than people give it credit for. Uh, as far as consistency and keeping a group tight without getting spitters and things like that. Um, you know, and the stuff, you know, everything you buy, uh, well, nothing you buy is perfect. I don't care how much you spend on an action, you can make it better. Um, that goes for a lot of things. I mean, uh, and so just different techniques, just, just keep it on doing that sort of stuff, I think is what's fun. And it does, it benefits everybody. A guy, yeah, they can have somebody put them together a rifle. The load data is out there, gets them close. They still got to put the work in, but it gets them close in the ballpark. And yeah, I mean, I've had, I've had shooters. I can think of one guy right now um, that I built him his first rifle. And, and I think it was his first actual rifle rifle, not just competition rifle, but it was certainly his first bench gun. He had never shot competition before. Um, and, you know, kind of just got him started in the right direction. Here's how you tune, or at least here's how, here's how I tune. And then, you know, take it from here. But, you know, this will get you, you know, to where I'm at. And then, and then now I'm asking this guy questions, you know. So he's become a great shooter. His first registered match he went to, he broke two or three records, his very first match in the MBRSA. And so, but you know, he just picked it up. He's a, he's a sharp guy. He put in the work. He's constantly sending me targets, the tuning. And, uh, and like I said, you know, now, now he's one of them guys that, you know, I'll ask questions, you know? Um, so, so yeah, if a guy is willing to put in, and that's what it is, it's it's work. It really is. Um, whether it, no matter what game it is, I don't care if it's PRS, if it's F class, if it's Ventrest, it's it's all going to come down to putting in the work. You can have the best stuff, um, but you got to learn to tune. You got to enjoy tuning, you know. Because I've I've definitely had customers that, you know, say, you know, I don't really enjoy tuning. I just want the gun to shoot. And that's like, well. If you don't enjoy it, you're probably never going to get good at it. And that's a problem. 
the uh, that's for sure. Tuning can be very frustrating, and yeah. but if you enjoy it, like you know, I've I've been chasing this whole precision thing, you know, uh, and for for a long time, uh, you know, I mean, you and I met on Accurate Shooter many many years ago, and there's all these theories and all this, and, and you know, fast forward ten years, like we have now, and a lot of what we used to be so passionate about and discuss and argue and i mean literally uh just go to fighting words uh now we go huh turns out it really didn't matter but at the time we were we we were 100 percent sure and the reason i know it doesn't matter is because i kept testing and and i didn't just dig in my heels in, in that thing you know whatever it was i decided to challenge it myself and test other things and you know, so on and so forth until you start realizing, well, it may matter, but not as much, you know, for example, concentricity, I used to just obsess over freaking run out. And now I don't know the last time I used my concentricity gauge, I use it when I set up a new cartridge, just to make sure my dice aren't screwed up or something's not wrong. But I don't, I don't, I don't measure my ammo. It's, it is what it is. You know, you know that that's one of those things that I, uh, you know, in, at least in my thought, we've got chamber dimensions. So let's say we've got you know half a thou clearance around the bullet in the free bore. We've got you know maybe a thou at the base of the cartridge. Probably got a couple thou at the shoulder. Um, how crooked can it be once it's in the chamber? It can't be that crooked, and I, and I think that's why it doesn't matter. Uh, and and so, and there's a lot of guys out there that that uh, would argue that it matters, and they've proven it to themselves, and that's good. Then they should keep doing that. I've tested it on and off for probably ten years. I've never been able to shoot a target that would make me think straighter ammo shot better. But if if you believe it does, then you should keep doing it. I, uh, before we get too far away, let, let's, let's back up and talk about timing, uh, you know, ignition timing and, and ignition, that is a big topic. And I think we better just jump on it before we get too far down <laughs> because, uh, I learned that from Speedy when I first took his gunsmithing class, he said, if, if I was to be handed an action that I knew nothing about. And somebody was like, Speedy, you have to compete with this action. But you can only either true up the action or true up the, the bolt. You can only do one. He goes, I would absolutely true up the bolt and the timing and the ignition and all that. He goes, it's yeah. just way more important than everything else. Um, so what is it that you have found that, that helps? Or what is it that somebody, I mean, you're, you're, a, uh, you're big on, on, Timing, you know, like like uh, extraction, obviously is important, but also, uh, you know, cock on close, cock on open, neutral. Talk a, talk about yeah. that, and maybe the spring weights and and whatever you think is a a combination that you have found that is just a winning combination. So, you know, we're we're talking about custom actions, um, and so you know, at least with nothing that's coming out today that we're using. So extraction timing is, is not a problem. We don't have to work on that. Um, ignition timing, um, it's, not, it's not as big of an issue as it used to be. Um, seems like you know the, the better actions that we're using, for the most part, there's still a couple that are not timed from the factory, uh, or not meant to be timed, I should say, because anything that comes out of the factory, there's some variations, it's variations in triggers. So, it's not uncommon to have to just fine tune, just tweak that timing, um, which that's no big deal. But, you know, I'm not having a recut cocking cam helixes anymore like, like I used to. I think the first, the first action, it was a bat MB um, that I had. And it was a bench gun, dasher. And back then they had a shallow cocking ramp in them. And so, which meant if you timed and I guess to explain what timing is, it's, it's what it does is it gives you a smooth bolt close, but a timed action, 
the cocking piece is picked up by the trigger at the same time lugs clear the closing cams in the front of the action. So that happens all at the same time. So it can be finicky um, to get it perfect. Um, although it's not a big deal on actions that are like a board and, you know, that action's meant to be timed. And so um, you don't have to do any major surgery to them. And the newer bats, you don't have to either. Um, but back then they had a shallow ramp in them. So you could only get about 210 thousandths of firing pin fall if you wanted that smooth close. Um, and so you had to put a little cock on close into them, which, you know, like a Remington style ignition is designed, you know, to have cock on close. Just for example, they want, say you want a quarter inch firing pin fall. Uh, you're going to get, you know, let's say 210 thousandths of that when you open the bolt, and then you're going to pick up the other 40 when you close it. And so the, if, if there's a benefit to that, it's that they do open easier because the ramp is, is laid down to a shallower angle. But they're clunky on the closing, and it doesn't bother some people. I can't stand it. I absolutely can't stand it. And so, yeah, that was back then. I had to recut those ramps to a different angle uh, so I could get that pinfall out of them that I was looking for without the cock on close. And that was a lot of work. Um, and so bat changed that. I don't, I don't have to do that anymore. Um, and of course, Bordens have always you know, been that way for a long time. Um, you know, Calbleys are not timed and they, you know, they intentionally do that because they open easier. So if that's your preference, you know, you've got that option, but, um, and so, yeah, I kind of, I'm, I'm a, I kind of like firing pinfall, you know, I've done the primer indention tests, um, a lot of tests on target downrange, different spring weights, things that it, like that. And. There is no perfect ignition. And so say you're shooting a particular primer, like a, a CCI, for example, uh, versus a federal. That CCI is going to want to get hit a lot harder than that federal. And so, you know, if I want to set up an ignition to run federals, you know, I've got a combination for that. If I want it to run BR4s or, or whatever, CCI primer, typically I'm gonna put a heavier spring in that action. Um, the firing pinfall, for the most part, I'll take as much as I can get. I don't see a downside to, um, I mean, these are all bag guns. We don't have to even consider lock time or anything like that. Plus a modern action, they're, they're, they're fast anyways. Um, and so that's kind of the thing you have to, you almost have to, once you get to that level where you think you've, you've got everything out of the gun you can get, you need to probably play with just some springs uh, <clears throat> and see if you can improve your ignition for your primer. And of course you should have already tested primers first, but you know, we just kind of have done enough of it to now, I know, I kind of prefer a CCI for agging in, um, at least in, in long range bench rest. I think it's a little better agging primer. Whereas that federal, it, it seems to narrow up the node a tiny bit, but it, it potentially could shoot smaller. I don't, they're, they're really close, but I've seen some really good stuff with the, with the federal. So it just kind of depends on what we're trying to do. And then of course, any clearancing, you know, that's a whole other thing. You know, everybody's got their opinions on, you know, the design of a shroud and, and what they do. and uh, where it should be tight, where it should be loose. Obviously, we never want drag or bind. Um, but I, I fit oversized shrouds to uh, some of the actions that I use, and I feel like it improves. If, if you can stabilize that shroud, uh, you don't have to clearance things as much to eliminate a bind, so long as everything's straight to begin with or, or close. Um, and so basically, I can get no no drag or no bind without having it get sloppy. And so we can keep things a little tighter, with, which should reduce vibrations. Uh, and so really, the problem is when you get stuff that's not straight and it's binding up, you have really no other option but to start adding clearance. And that's fine, and, and, that, and you should, you have to. Um, and in certain places, it just makes no difference. 
but like inside the shroud around the firing pin, you know, you don't like to have to clearance that up too much, um, but sometimes you have to. So every action is an individual. Um, every once in a great while, I'll get one that I say, there, I can't, I'm not going to touch it as far as that stuff goes. It's, there's no drag, there's no bind anywhere. I can't, I can't make it any better than it is. That's maybe like one out of a hundred. Um, but unfortunately, I mean, I've kind of come to the conclusion that there is no perfect, okay, I'm going to do this firing pin mass, this amount of pinfall, this spring, and it's period going to shoot the butt best. Um, if I'm, if I'm going to do that, which I, I mean, obviously I've got to set them up to shoot the best. I definitely err on the heavy side as far as springs go. Um, what would you call heavy side? Well, I mean, depends on the action, but you know, 23 plus, you know, but that's actual measurement too. A lot of these springs, you buy a 28 pound spring, it doesn't measure that, you know? So I'm talking actual measurement in the cock position. You can definitely go lower, um, definitely go lower if you're going to do the testing, you know, make sure, you know, I just built the gun and sent it out with a spring that was way lighter than I would ever want him to run, but he really wanted it to run good. So I said, fine, if you're seeing vertical, if you're seeing missed shots high or low, put this other spring back in the gun. So, I mean, so long as you're paying attention to what you're doing and you're, you're watching the targets, and you realize uh, that you're getting ignition flyers, then you can start experiment with a lighter spring. Uh, and some combinations work that way, but unfortunately, uh, if you get to know a cartridge really, really well, I can pretty much, like on, on these bench guns with a BRA, you know, I, I pretty much have it down to where I'm satisfied with it. As far as, well, I'm not satisfied with it, but as far as the spring, the, the whole, the firing weight, the, the spring weight, the mass of the pin and the fall, um, I mean, they're shooting ones and zeros in testing three shot groups, pretty regular. Um, so it's, it's going to be kind of hard to probably beat on that. And we don't fight flyers really ever. So, um, so to answer your question, I mean, there are certain things that are always apply. You got to have enough firing pinfall. I don't think you can make up for a lack of firing pinfall by putting more spring on it. You don't want drag or bind, obviously. That's always a good thing. And that spring, I don't think anybody should fall in love with a certain spring. If you really are kind of a, a, a tester, you might, you might try a few different springs and, uh, I mean, unless the gun's shooting, then obviously you're there. But if you think you can suck a little bit more out of it, then, you know, that's, I guess that's all. What about these uh, lighter titanium firing pins and no. things of that nature? No, you got to have that mass. And so it's, it's kind of like, um, well, there's a couple of examples. I mean, back when I was into drag racing and, and, and you know, we had uh, bracket racing, you know, the heavier cars, they ran masses consistency, first of all. The heavier cars always ran a more consistent time. Um, and it's, it's kind of it's kinda like energy. You could say, um, you can do the, the calculations and say it's going faster, it has the same amount of energy, but it's different. It's like a sledgehammer versus uh, a ball peen hammer. And you can sw swing the small hammer a lot faster and maybe on paper they have the same energy, but it's different. So you need that mass. You don't, I'm not a fan of lightweight firing pins. Now, the other thing that, uh, what's a sign, you know, a lot of people, uh, when you, when you dry fire a rifle and that bolt handle jumps, why does it do that? And is it, is it detrimental? And if so, how do you fix it? Yeah, I don't really think it is. I mean, if you put a, um, if you put a, a fired cartridge in there or, or a dummy with a primer in it, it, it probably won't jump once there's a cartridge in the chamber. So, and there's a couple of reasons it's jumping. Um, you know, when you close that bolt handle, it stops against steel, stops against the action. 
and then the rear of the bolts up because it's because the shroud lift from the trigger. And so when you when you dry fire that, the bolt drops, which levers that handle up. And that's one reason. The other reason is when you compress a spring, it, it rotates. And so when you dry fire it, that spring is rotating, which wants to turn the shroud, which flips up the handle. So no, I don't I don't think it's a problem. I played with that. I did all kinds of stuff to to uh, minimize that, and I really didn't see anything on target. I, I just didn't see anything there. Um, I don't like it. Anything we can do to eliminate movement there, and I've got some ideas I'm going to play with. Um, uh, I'm going to I'm probably never going to get rid of that rotation, but I got some ideas I want to try to to see at least to reduce the vibrations that could be happening from that. Again, it's going to be so small. I mean, the guns are shooting so small right now. Um, you know, I, I, it, it's something I'm going to try though, but no, I don't think, I don't think it's hurting guys. I mean, we're, we're shooting, these guys are shooting ones and twos, I'm not going to say all the time, but pretty regular. It's no accident. Um, and so I, I think until you're shooting ones and twos, you're probably not going to see an improvement there if there is one to see. I mean, that's kind now, of the when you say ones and twos, what do you mean when you say ones and twos, like 0.1 and 0.2 at 100? No. Or like, you mean one and twos at 1,000? Like that at 1,000. That's okay. A, that's, that's different. Inch. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not going to say they're that's happening all the all the time, but you know, I I shot um, the the last one of the last matches I shot. I shot back to back, inch and a half and a, and a one six. Um, that, that's pretty darn good. But in the, in the testing and the tuning and stuff like that, um, which I use three shots, and a lot of guys use three shots for tuning. They're shooting zeros and ones for three pretty often um, with the guys that are capable of tuning to that level, obviously. Um, and so that's where we're at with our current ignitions. Um, and uh, so I, I guess that's what I'm saying is until you're shooting at that level, if there is something with that bolt handle jump, it's, it's not stopping us from doing that. And so, like I said, I'm gonna continue to work on that got some ideas. I'm going to build a rifle here pretty soon for, for a very good shooter that could shoot the difference if, if there is one to be shot. Uh, and that's kind of the other thing when you're, when you're messing with that kind of stuff, you got to have somebody that can shoot like that to see the difference. So luckily, um, fortunately, I'm, I'm lucky enough to have a handful of customers that can do that and help, help this testing. Now, I'm going to, maybe we won't spend too much time on it, but, you know, you talk about three-shot groups. Uh, lately, there's been a, a kind of, you know, Brian Litz and uh, Jaden Quinlan from Hornady, they kind of been talking about the, that, that level of, or that size groups is pretty much insignificant statistically. Uh, what, what do you say to that? Uh, because, you know, uh, I don't disagree with them, but we just can't do what they, you know, say, oh, you got to do 30 to 50 shot groups. Well, you know, we'll burn out a barrel right. if we, if we right. do that. <clears throat> I mean, what do you think? What do you think is the reason that we can, we can actually get uh, good results with very small sampling? Um, I mean, I think they're right. It probably is statistically insignificant as far as statistics go, but I don't really care about that. I, I just know what we what we do and what we can do. Not everybody uses three. I mean, some of my some of my customers they still want to shoot five, you know, to, to or, or sometimes even ten to verify. Personally, three. I've, every rifle I've owned and tuned in my life has been three shot groups. It, it's worked fine for me. I think you've got to know when not to shoot. If if you show up to the range and the wind is switching hard and the mirage is boiling and it's just going to be a waste to do your testing. 
And I, I see this very often where guys will post up a target and they'll say, what do you think I should do? Uh, and, and they'll say, okay, try this powder charge, try it. that one looks good. Or they're trying to interpret a mess. And what he should do is throw it away, ignore it, and, and do it on a day where you can get meaningful data. So that's part of the problem. I think the other part of it is, you know, if you have good guns that shoot like they should, they're shooting small and you have good bullets, good technique, um, I just don't see a reason that you need to shoot that many rounds. I mean, the rifles do what they do. And you don't look at one group. You know, if you do a test and it shoots one group and everything around it was a mess, okay, well, you don't chase that. But if you see, uh, if I'm shooting three shot groups and I see I'm going up in powder charge and it goes from a four inch group to a three inch group to a two inch group to a one and back up to a four, you can trust that. Um, that is what you the expect. Pattern. You gotta, yeah. Yeah. You can look at the whole pattern. Yep. The whole thing. You're looking at the entire target. And so if it does what you expected it to do, you know, you're coming in and out of a seating depth, coming in and out of a powder charge. Um, you're not just looking at an individual group. Then you can have confidence in that target. Um, if, if your gun won't shoot, I mean, it, if you're talking a factory rifle or a one minute or, or worse type of rifle, yeah, you're going to have to shoot a lot more shots because there's a lot more variation, but, um, you know, so I, I guess maybe they're not speaking to us when they're saying that, um, because these rifles, you got to take them to a match. You can't burn them out tuning them. So you got to come up with a way that you can find a good load and a reasonable amount of rounds uh, so you can actually take it to a match and do what you're supposed to be doing with it. So uh, I don't know. I, I have not had trouble with it. And I would say the majority of the records that my rifles have broke, and you know, I stay in touch with most of these guys. I see a lot of the tuning targets. I'm going to say the majority of them were tuned with three or four shot groups. Now, and, and that's probably correct. I mean, the, the 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 rifles are so good that we can trust the results, even the small samples, right? Because uh, the I guess the way I see it is when I'm testing, it, it's not so much that the small groups tell me everything I need to know. It's mainly the big ones that tell me where I don't want to be, right? Right. It, it's just like okay, for for this powder charge, this sitting dip, whatever, this primer. There's this this you know node that just consistent small, you know. But if I do this, all of a sudden they're big, and I do that, they're big groups. So, you know, I want to stay away from that and maybe experiment more. And obviously, once I kind of latch on to something, I do a lot more tuning. And sometimes I just have to abandon it, you know, just because like, well, that was wrong. But, uh, you know, again, I think big groups tell us more about what we need to know than the, than the small ones do. Well, yeah, and that's that's probably true, I think. And two, just kind of learning to interpret a target. Um, I think a lot of guys, when it comes to tuning, you know, I'll get a phone call say I got 400 rounds on the barrel and I just can't get it to shoot. And, and I say, okay, well, what powders and bullets and what have you all tried? One powder, one bullet, one primer, just trying to force it to shoot. You know, they haven't, you got to look at a target and say, okay, something ain't happy. We need to try a different powder or a different bullet or a different primer or neck tension. And, and that just takes time to kind of recognize you got to, you have to do it to learn how to do it. And, and you start to see a pattern. Okay. That tells me I should try a different powder or that tells me I should try a different primer. And, um, that just takes time. I mean, I can't really, that's one of the things I recommend guys do. If, if you got a bunch of buddies, cause we do this, if you got a bunch of buddies that shoot F class or bench rest or whatever, and uh, get on a group text, you know, say there's three or four or five of you guys that are always constantly tuning rifles and share those targets with, with everybody and get advice 
Uh, I mean, we do that all the time. Guys will send these targets and, and we'll all kind of look at them and agree like, this is what we, this is what I would do next. And um, I think it, it's helped a lot of guys um, improve their tuning. Cause that's just, that's such an important part of this game. It's, if you can't tune a rifle and keep it in tune, that's, it's it's important I and mean, the guys really need to learn that if they want to they're trying to beat you know win matches and be competitive yeah the uh what about you know you touched on uh at some point you just got to give up on 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 that load you know and just got to change something what how much how much time do you give a barrel that you know at, at what point do you say okay i'm you know this is just not going to shoot. Well, you know, if it's something that I know, a cartridge that I know well, you know, I've shot it before. Um, I've shot this bullet and this powder and, and this combination in it before. And it doesn't, it's not acting right. Uh, you know, I probably would change powders if, if I've got another one. It's hard to find powders right now. So um, it's it's not like that's as easy as as it used to be, but... Um, honestly, I don't give them that much time. If, if it's a bench gun or an F class gun or something that we know the cartridge pretty well, we've shot it before. Um, and we, we run our powder charge and, and seating depth testing and all this sort of stuff. And if I can't see it, at least looking like it is tunable, um, it's gotta, it's, it's gotta look tunable. If it's, if it's a mess, then. I'll give it a couple of powders, maybe a, maybe a couple of different bullets, but I, one of the ones I, I, I chambered a six creed more barrel because, um, uh, I, I've been impressed with what they do in hunting rifles. Um, and I've shot some two and three inch groups of little seven pound sporters with that combination. And, and so have a lot of guys that I've built them for, I, I thought it was accurate enough that I wanted to try it and interest. Uh, with a heavier bullet, of course, that's what tamed it down to make it seem a 115 VLD tamed it down. And so, anyhow, now uh, again, I want to, I want, I want to clarify before we go further. When you say two, three, you you speak everything you speak about is a thousand yards, correct? For the most part, I I really haven't shot much other distance. Uh, well, because you said you you've seen some two and two two and three inch groups, and I'm afraid people are going to think a hundred yards. This oh, is a yeah. thousand yards. Yeah, I pretty much okay, keep going. strictly tune at a thousand yards. I will do it at six hundred if it's a hunting gun that I'm never going to use beyond six hundred. Sometimes I'll shoot it at six hundred. Yeah, I don't do any tuning at a hundred personally. Um, yeah. So anyhow, I chambered up a a barrel for my bench gun. I screwed it on, and right off the get go, it didn't look good. I mean, that's that little sporter would out shoot it. I think that it went to it probably didn't have a hundred rounds, and I pulled it. I bet I pulled it at eighty. It just it was, there was nothing there telling me that this barrel was going to shoot. It did not have any pattern whatsoever. Um, now on a hunting rifle or something of uh, that nature, say a Magnum, um, sometimes they can be a little more finicky and I'll give them more time. I'll fight those things a little bit more. Um, you know, I had a 300 PRC that shot phenomenal on day one on new brass, like I did start that one at 600 and it was shooting like inch and a half, inch one seven. But after I cycled that brass, I couldn't make it shoot. I took it to a thousand, it was shooting eight inches of vertical. I could not make it shoot less than eight inches of vertical. All the powder charges, all the seating depths. And so I was about to pull the barrel and I decided to do neck tension. And I was running about two because that's what the virgin brass was that shot good. Well, I, I ran it up to five. And when I got to five, it shrunk right up. That rifle agged probably three and a half inches for the next five cold bore groups. Um, and that was just three shots of cold bore across five different days. And the ag was about three and a half inches. And so for whatever reason, it needed all that neck tension to, to settle it down again. But I think probably had 400 rounds on it before I figured it out. And then it turned out to be one of the most solid rifles I'd ever had for that style of rifle. 
So let's talk about an extension. Uh, how do you tune an extension? Because I kind of do like what you do is like, well, just I know this works for this cartridge. I and I'll just use that and and just keep on trucking. I do like this PRCW when I first got it, I tested different neck tensions just to see where it liked to, you know, it liked to be. Yeah. But I kind of pretty much settled on about two to three thousands. Uh, again, because I used to shoot really light, light neck tensions before, but I had a lot of issues traveling with them because, you know, I have to travel a lot, you know, preload ammo. And I, uh, I knew that wasn't, you know, and I did have an issue where all the bullets settled down into the cases and uh, it was just a, a mess. So I started seating, uh, you know, tighter, you know, higher neck tensions. But uh, do you have a process for tuning uh, neck tension? And if so, at what point do you tune? So, you know, unlike a primer, neck tension doesn't seem to change the node. If we'll call it a node, whatever. It doesn't seem to affect um, the rest of the tune. Unlike a primer, you change a primer, you can't just just swap the primer. You really need to shoot groups across a powder charge window because that primer change can move the node. So like you asked earlier, do we have velocity nodes? Well, change the primer and you can move where the gun will shoot. And so you, you got to cover ground when you do a primer. Uh, neck tension doesn't seem to be that way. So if, if the rifle is shooting well throughout the testing, uh, typically neck tensions last. It's one of the last things I do. I'll take my that final load and I'll just try the, the different bushings and um, and see which one groups the best. If I'm kind of fighting with it, I might I might go to neck tension a little sooner because uh, if if you're on the wrong bushing, on the wrong neck tension, I mean they can be untunable. You can't fix them. So and it's really strange. This stuff. Um, part of the reason that I do try to do everything at a thousand, sometimes you can't see it until you get out to a thousand, you know, that vertical or that, that neck tension fighting you sometimes at mid range, it will shoot well. And then when you get out, out to a thousand, you can't, you can't fix it. I can't explain that, but I've seen it enough times to, you know, I know this, this, the, the, the scientist will ask me why, and I don't know why I don't need to know why. Uh, we just know what works. So um, typically that would be maybe the last thing. Um, but once you get to know a cartridge, eh, you probably can, can get away without doing it. Um, you know, if, if you, you chamber a bunch of barrels for this PRC, uh, if, if two to three is working for you on this one, it's, it's probably going to work for you on the rest of them unless you change something. If you switch to a different powder, um, it might have a different preference. So, yeah, the uh, I, I've I've noticed the same thing. Uh, you know, I'll I'll, I'll final I, I start with about two to three thousands, depending on, and I say about because uh, you know I I I use expander mandrels, so okay. if I end up somewhere two to three, I'm happy with it. Uh, and then I start tuning with that, and and then uh, I keep the exact same expander mandrel. I just change the the bushing, right? And a smaller bushing, even with the exact same size expander mandrel, is gonna it's gonna end up with a tighter neck because it's gonna have more neck uh, more spring back. But anyway, I start there, and then uh, when it's all when I have it tuned, uh, I experiment more with a tuned rifle than I do without it. I guess what I'm getting at is once I have a tune that I like, I go, let's see if I can get it tighter. Let me change neck, neck tension. Let me let me change this, that, and the other, because I, I can always fall back to where I started, right? But uh, yeah, so that's, uh, that's how I tune or test neck tension as well. Uh, another yeah. question that I have for you is, uh, you and I kind of disagree on the whole finding the lance thing, because uh, uh, you know I've I've gotten to the point where I just I don't care I don't care where the lance are at if it shoots it shoots you know what I mean, and I think we're both in agreement there. But you like to know exactly where the lance are, and Todd Hendricks, him and I have this discussion all the time, and he's like, "You got to know where they're at," and I'm like, "I don't care if it shoots small, it shoots small." But anyway, elaborate on on your. Uh, how you see the lance and why it's so important to know where they're at. 
Well, and do you uh, chase? Do you recommend chasing the lands or not? Okay. Yeah. Um, I like to know where they're at. Um, it, I can strip a bull and find that touch point and I don't know, it takes maybe two minutes to do it. So it's, to me, it's just not a, an issue to do it. And I will do it every single time I load that rifle every, every single time before I start loading, I want to know, did that, did we just make a big jump? Because if we did, you know, if that rifling just moved 3000 since the last time I measured it, now I know I'm potentially in trouble. It, it may not want you to chase it, but it, it might. Um, and it might want half value or it might want full value. And so I would, I want to know that before I walk up to the bench and shoot a big group. Um, because if, if that was to happen, potentially I'd shoot a few uh, ciders at a, at a longer seating depth, you know, to see, uh, do I, if I've got vertical in the, in the load, I might want to chase it and I can do that. So uh, that's why I like to know where they're at. Uh, and also for me being, you know, building rifles and chamber and barrels and stuff, certain cartridges, you know, we have them dialed in so well that if I'm using the same reamer, I know what my customer's bullet's gonna be. You know, I can get that guy so close. Um, and, and if I tell him to seat that bullet six thousandths in the rifling, I know the vast majority of barrels out there, it, that's going to be really, really close. It's going to work for them right off the bat. Not always, but the vast majority of the time. So if they do my method, not my method, but you know the method the guys out here all do, if they find that touch point and my six in is the same as their six in, that helps me to help them. Um, and so that's kind of that's kind of why, you know, I got a couple of reasons why I like to know exactly where, and I'd like my customers to know where they are. I mean, if if you call me and say my gun's shooting, and I say where where's that bullet seated, and they say I don't know, well, hang up the phone, go figure it out because I can't help you. I mean, if you're not in the ballpark, um, you know, so that's part of it. Uh, and, and for example, my last rifle I had, it would shoot in the ones. Uh, at eight in, seven in, and six in, it would hold in the ones. Nine in would go vertical, probably six inches, and then uh, four or five would drop, and they'd go vertical, probably four inches. So I've got a window of three thousandths. I can go a thou either way. When you're trying to make them shoot that small, the windows are almost non-existent, and so. Um, when we're trying to nail a window that small, um, the more information, the better. But I, I'm not saying that your your way or the jam. I mean, you're right. As long as it's, if it shoots, it shoots, and if it goes out of tune, you just move it out if if that's what it takes. So I, I think we're basically doing the same thing. I just I like I like the information. Yeah, and I'm I'm okay with that. Uh, it's just like, like, I just, I guess what, where this whole stop chasing the lands thing uh, came from. And, and if people watch that video, they'll understand that we're both on the same, pretty much, we, we're both in agreement. And we're just arriving at it in a different direction. Uh, what I found, you know, which is what you said earlier, sometimes they like to be chased, sometimes they don't. And so it has to be verified on the target, which that's what I'm, what I said, you know test three and six out and if you need to move move and if not don't move but th the entire reason that i made that video because i would see a lot of shooters in f class go they go clean the rifle measure and move the seating depth and then just go for score the next day right and by the end of the competition now they moved it six to ten thousands and now on the last day their their guns are spraying all over and they go right. Well, you know, the, the range has a vertical or whatever. It's like, no, you're taking your rifle out of tune yourself. You're doing it yourself. So don't just go about it blindly. You know, it's not a, again, uh, you and I are in agreement because you said earlier, it, sometimes it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. Sometimes they just don't like it. And yeah. you don't know until you test it. And that's, I guess what we're both saying is whether you know where they're at or not, you got to test either way. <laughs> and what yeah. shoots, shoots, you can't argue. You got to no. believe the target, you know? No, uh, yeah, and that's it. And, and unfortunately, sometimes we don't have that opportunity. And, and so if I, 
if I sat down to load for a match for tomorrow's match, because you know, a lot of guys bring their campers and stuff, and, and most guys at Deep Creek, anyways, are loading at the range. You can't do it between targets, but you you can do it the night before for the next re, you know the next morning's match. And say say I I couldn't shoot that night to verify that uh, something changed, and I clean the gun and I see oh, the throat move three thousandths, and I know I got a three thousandths window. I probably would move it out a thousand and a half. It would put me on the extreme end of my old window, just in case it wanted chasing. So I probably would make that guess if I had to, and I guess. You know, say if it did something stupid and it moved five or ten thousandths, then you then you would know you're screwed. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, and them guys, if they're moving the throats that often, I, they need to probably keep the I/O so out of them. I know, I know. Um, it, I'm not I'm not against abrasives, uh, but I do know that when we were using I/O so to clean. Uh, it move that throat probably two thousands, you know, um, and I'm not saying even aggressive, you know, short stroking it, whatever ten times or something like that, um, with a patch over a nylon brush or, or or whatever they were doing. But we'd see the barrel, the throat moved more when we used those abrasives uh, on a regular basis. It they shot, there was not a problem with it, but it is harder to keep up on them. Uh, and then as we throttled that back uh, and, and we only kind of used them as necessary, that seemed to help the throat life. And one of the things that I do know for a fact uh, is important to, to very fine accuracy, that throat needs to be sharp. You start smoothing it out, taking the sharp edges off of it and, and the groups open up. And, and I know this because you can take a throater and punch it out five thousandths and, and bring the accuracy back. So kind of like when a guy, when they set barrels back, you hear guys talk about setting barrels back. That's what they're doing. Uh, they're cleaning that throat up. I don't think, uh, you know, they're not chopping off bad barrel. It's just that they're cleaning that throat up. I would suspect that if they, they probably don't want to run a throater in there because they want to stay on their reamer, but I would suspect they would probably achieve the similar thing just by throating it out if they could. So, um, so I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty delicate on the throats. Obviously, at some point you have to get a little more aggressive. But early in a barrel's life, when before the fire cracking or anything starts, I, I try to stay out of them. Okay, so you said, uh, you know, you say also maybe just when needed. How, when do you decide that it's necessary or, you know, abrasives? Yeah, I mean, you can actually feel it on the brush when you're pulling because I use a bronze brush um, and I clean often. And so that's the other thing. If I shoot the gun, I clean it. Um, I don't care if that's 15 rounds or if that was 50 rounds. Um, I use a brush and patches and nothing really unique. But if you're, when, as you're pulling that brush back through, when you start to get carbon buildup, you'll feel it. When that brush gets close to the throat, it'll feel tight. You'll feel it. You can feel the roughness in there. And so before I owned a bore scope a long time ago, when that's when I would JB it. I'd feel that and I'd get in there and I would JB it. Um, and it worked very well. Uh, now, you know, everybody's got a bore scope now, so you can, you can get in there and look at it. A tiny bit of black streaking in a groove doesn't bother me. Um, you know, a, a little bit of carbon in there, and I mean, a little bit is, is all relative, but I'm saying light black streaking, nothing that's building up. Um, we don't want copper in there either. I mean, but minimal amount of fouling um, is fine. It's, it's once you start to see that carbon growing, you know, if you're bore scoping on a regular basis and you say, okay, I'm maintaining, I'm keeping it maintained. And of course, as the barrel ages and, and uh, you, you just have to get more and more aggressive. So I guess the cleaning regimen changes as the barrel changes. I see. I see. Um, now let's talk about positive compensation. Um, I know you're a big believer, or at least I think you are. Can you explain 
what positive compensation is and, uh, you know, kind of the benefits of it? Yeah, I mean, I would definitely say I'm a believer. Uh, at least I can't explain it any other way. How can you shoot? How can you shoot an inch of vertical with 20 foot of ES? Not even, not even considering all of the BC variations and and the, the all the other environmentals uh, and, and aiming error, everything. I, I mean, I can't explain how that's even possible if it didn't exist. So yeah, it, to me, it, it answers the question as to as to why it's possible, and uh, uh, and it's probably it's the main reason I tune them at a thousand. So. I guess what it is, is we've got faster bullets and slower bullets. If you can, if you can get the barrel tuned to a harmonic where the slower bullets uh, are, le are leaving at a higher trajectory than the faster bullets, you know, at some point downrange, they're going to intersect, you know, converge across paths. And, 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 uh, uh, and so that's, that's kind of what it is. And it's why uh, to achieve it, you almost have to tune at the distance that you want that perfect tune. Uh, because if say, if say if we tuned it at 600 for positive compensation and, and we're shooting tiny, well, if those bullets have crossed pass, paths, you're gonna have vertical at longer distances. And so, uh, you know, they might say, no, that's not true. It's not really the lits thing. It's, it's not the, how do they shoot smaller MOA down range? It's not, um, it's not the going to sleep thing or, or whatever other theories. Um, it, it, it's just a strictly in a vertical plane. And so, you know, could I prove it? I, yeah, I mean, I suppose if you really cared to prove it to somebody, which I don't, I don't really care if people think it's right or wrong. Uh, I guess you could set up targets. Um, you know, you can bring the gun back to a hundred yards and see, you know, is it shooting larger than it did at a thousand MOA wise? And we've seen that a lot. Um, I mean, that, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't surprise me to see, you know, if you pulled, pulled a rifle back that was shooting in the ones and you pulled it back to a hundred, if it shot in the twos, I wouldn't even, it wouldn't surprise me a bit. So, uh, I don't know. I've seen so many targets. I've just seen it so many times that I've never seen anything to make me doubt that it, that's how we're doing this. So again, I don't care. I'm not here to prove that theory to anybody, but if somebody asks, how is that possible? Yeah. And I understand uh, chronograph error too, but we've been doing this for, well, these, a lot of these guys have been doing it longer than me. I've been doing it for 15 years, tuning at a thousand. And uh, if I had to pick a load based on chronograph numbers alone, that was the only data I get. I would pick 12 feet of ES. That's what I would pick. And because I, I have seen that kind of window of ES, uh, even up to 20, still shoot tiny. Most of the time, those really low ES groups, like zero to three, four, they're vertical. And I don't know why, but I mean, it's played out hundreds of times. And I mean, it's even funny, like my buddy Tom will send me some data. And and, and if there's a group with really low ES, or, or say the whole ladder, well, not ladder, but the whole tuning session had really, really good ES, I tell him it, it probably didn't shoot, you know. Your ES was too good. It's just a joke, but it plays out that way so often. <laughs> yeah. So how do you tune for positive compensation? Well, I mean, if you're doing it at the distance you're shooting and you achieve, uh, you achieve the best load possible, you've kind of done it. Um, you know, it's mostly so, the power. So, so I guess, I guess what I'm getting at is, uh, or I guess what, what I'm hearing is if you if you get to a thousand yards and it's shooting small and you have a big ES, you really don't care. You just just whatever shows up on target is, is yeah. what you're worried about, right? Yeah, I don't I don't care at all. Um I mean I didn't even 
have a chronograph until this lab radar thing came out because it wasn't worth the effort to set them up. I just got rid of it. I quit bringing it. And then now we set them up every time just because it's easy. Uh, and we don't really even look at the chronograph for anything other than, well, say the gun shoots really bad. Well, then we might look at the chronograph to see maybe we're, we're way off in velocity. Something, something's changed. But we don't use it really for tuning whatsoever. I mean, um, if, the, if the thing shot a small group and it repeats and it does it over and over, who cares about the numbers? Right. Right. Um, what about uh, stocks? Like what 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 has proven to shoot the best? Wood, laminate, you know, carbon fiber. Where do you stand in that? Well, unfortunately, that is not a clear. That's that has not been a clear. Um, there there hasn't been a clear winner there. There's exceptional rifles built on pretty much everything that you can, that's commonly used. And so when, when using my stocks, the Macmillan ones, probably one of my favorite versions of it had the foam fill. It was from the Action Ford and then the butt stock was urethane foam. And those things shot really good. And, um, and the way that the, the groups would form up and everything, the point, of, I, I, I'm pretty convinced the point of impact was more stable. They had more flex to them. Um, and that foam seems to do a good job of damping vibrations. This, the regular fiberglass ones, there's a bunch of winners built on those. And, and I have, I do, I got guys that like carbon fiber. Uh, they're ultra stiff. You know, that's not my favorite way to go. Um, but again, I've built rifles that have that have done some really good shooting on those. So it's not like that's a super clear answer. And then wood, I mean, wood always shoots. I think um, a lot of guys, I think the trend is going back to wood. And um, I guess my preference is the laminated wood because it's more consistent. If we find something we really like, I can get it over and over and over. Um, and even actual regular plywood without dye. A lot of them I'll paint those, but that stuff, I mean, when you're machining it, uh, you know, guys say it feels dead, but I mean, it just vibrates less in the mill than the standard laminates. And uh, that stuff, I mean, it's nothing to look at. You got to paint it, but that stuff is potentially some of the best stuff I've seen. I mean, some of the guns on that have broke lots of records. Um, some of the best guns that I can think of. But you wouldn't know it's plywood. It's under a paint job. Um, you, you, you make me want to build a plywood gun. Uh, and I would you. leave it unpainted. I would just <laughs> clear coat it. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm telling you, it's, I mean, the guys that know about those plywood ones and which guns have them, uh, that's what they request, you know, and um, they've been exceptional, exceptional. Um, and so have the laminates. My last one was a regular laminate. I painted it. It's, it's kind of my newer stock design. So it's a little lower profile and those only come in, in wood. So, um, but you know, my, the previous gun I had before that also, I shot a one in competition with it and it was awesome in testing. It shot zeros and ones for three shot groups in testing. That was a regular fiberglass, just the plain, what we called sporter fill fiberglass. Um, and, uh, so I wouldn't get too worked up over that. Um, if you like wood, shoot wood. If you like glass, shoot glass. Um, uh, you know, but I mean, the one thing, at least for me, is I don't like ultra stiff stocks. That's just me personally. Um, I think they're a little t more touchy. Um, and so... Um, but again, it's 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 everybody's personal preference. You know, obviously, if you're an FTR shooter and you're you're on the gun, you don't want a real flexible stock because you know you're going to bend it all over the place. But something sitting in the bags that you're not really touching, it's fine. So, um, but that was one of the things. Those foam stocks, they had a little more bounce to them, and it kind of 
it weirded people out. It was different. And so not a lot of guys wanted them, but the ones that were out there are really good. So, and now they won't make them for me anymore. They won't do the foam. So, <laughs> but the trend is the, definitely uh, going back to wood. That's wood. what guys want. Okay. All right. Anything else that uh, we should consider doing in, and uh, gluing in, them know, in the search for that very elusive zero groups at a thousand? Yeah. Glue all your actions in too. Oh yes, perfect. I'm glad you. I'm glad we touched on that because mine are glued in, and that's the you know because of Speedy. Like they got to be glued in. So let's talk about that because uh, that's yeah. a, that's one of those topics that uh, that most people uh, have heard about. But you know, let's let's talk about that. Yeah. So to me, I, I've been I, I'll glue everything in if if the customer will let me. Um, not hunt rifles and stuff that you need to take apart to change triggers, but competition rifles that have trigger hangers. Um, I, I, it's my preference to glue them in and I don't like doing it. It's a, it's a pain in the ass job, but, um, I have taken very good rifles and glued them in and I've seen the difference and I'm not saying you can't win matches. I'm not saying you can't get them to shoot way better than you need um, to shoot cleans. But I personally have seen small improvements. And if we're going to do everything possible, uh, I don't see any downside to it. You take the triggers, the barrels, you can do everything you need to do without taking the action out. Even if it's a bedding job, I don't want them taking the action out, you know, because you're just going to beat it up. So I still want them to treat it like a glue in. Um, but a perfect bedding job definitely can shoot. I'm sure most guys couldn't shoot the difference, but it's a difference between two surfaces that are touching, hopefully touching, and the difference between a bond. You know, if to me, if you got two parts that are touching, that's a source of potential vibration. If humidity or temperatures change, these stocks move. Fiberglass stocks, they all move. Um, I've measured this. You, you can sometimes see that uh, bedding pull right away on, on one day, and then the next day it's tight again. And I've seen that. I've measured it. And, and it's the probably the epoxies that were used in those stocks that just were kind of temperature sensitive. Wood, obviously, we know wood moves. Uh, humidity, temperature, everything, especially green wood that's maybe too green. So all of that stuff. Yeah, a perfect bedding jobs is fine, but the glue in, if it's done right, it's hypothetically, it's a hundred percent contact a hundred percent of the time, whereas a bedding job isn't. So, uh, it's my preference. And like I said, I'll do whatever the customer wants. Cause I don't think I wouldn't do anything to ever hurt the accuracy of a rifle, even if they wanted it. If I knew it wasn't going to shoot, I wouldn't do it. So I'm still fine to do a betting job. It's definitely still going to be competitive, but I know the glue ends shoot a little better. Yep. That's, uh, you know, again, Speedy, he's all about gluing in, like you got to glue it in, you got to glue it in. So, uh, mine are glued in. And the biggest reason for me <laughs> to have them glued in is, uh, getting it rained on. Uh, you know, right. I don't have to worry about water getting between the action and the, sure. and the stock. And, you know, in F-Class, F-Class, we get rained on quite often, especially when, you know, when I went to England, man, we, we got rained on every day. And I didn't ever have to worry right. about, you know, moisture between the action and the, yeah. and the bedding. Yeah, and that's another reason, I suppose, too. Um, I, I, the bottom line is there's no that, there's no downside to it. The vast majority of guys are not swapping stocks around. You know, they build the rifle and then after it's tuned, they're scared to even look at it. You know, they don't want to touch it. So um, there's just no reason to remove the action. Um, I get it. Guys that are traveling that want to break it down. I, I get it. I'd probably bring a barrel vice and just take the barrel off. But so, I mean, I, I can understand that, but I just don't see any downside whatsoever to doing it. Um, you got to do it right, though. I mean, I've taken plenty apart that, um, 
you know, came right apart, you know, whether there was, you know, oil in there or they didn't, they didn't, um, you know, scuff everything up good enough or whatever the, whatever the, the reason is. But, um, uh, and, and for us with our weight limits, you, you screw and glue them, you can still use the action screws and the fillers and everything else. So not like short range where there's nothing hold them in, but the bond. Um, so, so we, yeah, I mean, uh, obviously it could be a little more problematic hanging 32 inch barrels off of just a glue joint, but, uh, I know I glued in an ELR rifle. We're hanging some big barrels off of that sucker. Um, just, I don't know. I, I just don't see a negative to it and, and I've seen the positive. So most, most, I'd say 99% of the competition rifles I build get glued in. It's very rare that somebody doesn't want me to do it. What, what about pillars? You mentioned pillars. Is that uh, if you're just betting a, uh... A rifle uh are pillars absolutely necessary or how, how do you feel about that oh no i don't think so i i tested that in um a wood laminate stock it was a dasher six dasher bench gun i did a bunch of different testing on that particular rifle with bedding stuff you know the pad under the barrel versus no pad i think i added a third action screw to it and i did all this stuff after shooting it for a while and um, uh, I originally did it without pillars. Then I put the pillars in, rebedded it. You know, I did it, all of this stuff to just see, see what mattered and what didn't matter. I, I could shoot no difference between pillars versus no pillars. Now, over time, maybe, maybe something would compress, um, you know, maybe over time that could become a problem. You know, obviously, if you're compressing the wood, eventually your action screws are going to start hitting your bolt, and that's a problem. So, no, I don't. I think if if the stock is uh, a good solid material, uh, it's probably you're not going to shoot the difference there. But we do it just to prevent any future problems, and it's it's just expected. So, I think if I sent somebody a, a rifle without pillars in it, they'd freak out. But uh, I mean, yeah, very likely. Yeah, but no, and I've played with different materials too, aluminum, G10, you know, steel. You know, you could say one of them is more stable. One of them matches the material the action's made out of. Um, you know, again, I, I'm not seeing anything there that I'm, I'm going to say is, you know, critical. So... Man, this has been awesome. Thanks, Alex. Uh, no I know problem. we can probably go on for hours. Uh, yeah. How do they? How do they find you? Somebody wants you to, you know, build them a boomstick. How do they? Do, do you build complete rifles, or do you? What uh, do you do? Very, very few going forward. Um, I'm saying real busy chambering barrels, doing the metal work, the action work. Um, it's pretty much all I can do to stay up with that. And. Like, I mean, wheeleraccuracy.com is my website. Email is preferred. <laughs> um, text message or email. I mean, if I if I stop, everything stops. And so um, a lot of times if I'm in front of the lathe or, or whatever, I mean, I just don't have time to answer every call, but I sure try to get back to everybody at, within a day or two. But it's just me here, so. So um, if they want a PRCW, which is, uh, I would, I would, I would suggest that they get one because it's, uh, you know, the 24 Shehane is, it's great. I, I actually have a 24 Shehane that I did not take to Southwest Nationals because I'm saving it for the world championship. It actually shoots better than the PRCW, um, just a little bit slower, but you know, I think that's just an exceptional barrel, but yeah. the brass life on the PRCW is impressive i mean i'm at that that i won the southwest nationals with nine firings on the brass it's yeah it's it good shouldn't, stuff. you shouldn't probably ever wear it out i don't think yeah so anyway if they want to get a barrel from you you know you have the reamer obviously <laughs> yeah so, yeah i'm glad it's working out for you thank you thank you uh but anyway alex thank you so much and no problem. uh 
Oh, oh, before we go, you got to nominate somebody. Who do you think I should talk to? Oh, um, man, you've talked to a lot of people already. That's tough. Um, I don't think I've talked to a long range venture shooter yet. I mean, I talked to uh, Bart Souter, but I think his main gig is uh, short range. He's shooting a lot of 600. Um, you know, he's doing very well. Uh, if you want to talk to a long range bench rest shooter, I'd say, uh, I would nominate Tom Mausel. I mean, the guy is, is, uh, puts in a lot of work and tests everything. So, uh, he's a wealth of knowledge. Okay. I don't uh, know if he'll do it or not, but <laughs> oh, he no, would he be has interesting. To. He's been nominated. He, <laughs> it, he has no choice. That's how it works. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a rule that I made up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we didn't even get into all that scope testing that you did, but uh, is it still out there for people to find? I think it's on Bison Ballistics or somewhere. He, he published some of that stuff. But the main takeaway from all that is to test your scope. Don't use it as a buyer's guide. It's not what it was meant for. It wasn't meant to beat up on any scope or any brand. It was only meant to open people's eyes to how many scopes out there do not hold zero and uh you this this goes back to the uh you know what speedy taught me assume everything is broken until you check it most everything is broken <laughs> Man, that's, that's why the assumption should be that it is yep absolutely <laughs> yeah so yeah all right alex i appreciate you it. it you got it man see you thank you